This has been a topic I've been on a lot lately, which is, you know, fail and fail fast and get okay with the idea that you're not going to be doing well at everything at all times. Go try something new. Go test that idea. Go make mistakes. So rare. I was going to make a funny joke about that being a rare <laughs> last name, but uh, cool name nonetheless. Yeah. Uh, Self-proclaimed underground serial entrepreneur, investor, um, outsourcing expert, father and husband. There's so many things that we can talk about, but give us the, the Reader's Digest real quick on, on who you are, what you're up to, and we'll take it from there. Oh, man. I mean, you kind of said it. I'm just interested in building businesses. I like creating freedom. I like helping people create more time so that they can go spend their time with their family and those that they care about. My method is doing that through outsourcing. And it's doing it through using virtual assistants. And so I ended up building the virtual assistant company around that. And that's been, you know, my passion project for a long time on two sides of it. One is the creating, you know, freedom for some people. And then the other one is actually helping virtual assistants build careers and have, you know, an amazing life. And that's it. And then I love, you know, I love new ideas. And so if I get a new idea, I get to put it to play and see if it turns into anything and continue to build businesses as I go. But, uh, you know, my claim to fame is that my virtual assistants run my companies. Aside from a few projects a year, for the most part, I don't operate the companies. They're run by VAs. So that's kind of the underground. Nobody really knows what's going on. And then all of a sudden there's a new business. <laughs> right. Which is really cool. And the more entrepreneurs I talk to, the more you know, people in my circle, it becomes clear that a business isn't truly a business unless it runs without the operating. In mortgage and growing a mortgage business and in so many other businesses when you take out the operator and the, and and it no it's it ceases to correct you know, continue forward and produce income most people would say hey that's not a business you operating as a salesperson or, or doing whatnot so i'd love to dig into it too because like you said i think a lot of people are chasing efficiency and freedom and, and time with family it's i don't know if it's just me and the people that i'm surrounded with and the stuff that i'm looking at but it seems like you know, hustle culture, never, you know, seeing the, the outdoors or never spending time with family seems to be a, a fad that, that has faded. And in place of that, the new fad is, you know, in your case too, what I love about what you said is you're creating a real business, time for you and your family, while on the other side of it, creating opportunities Correct. for your virtual assistant. So it's yep. like a win, everybody's winning. So tell me about maybe the birth of that and how how that got started. I've had many businesses through my days. You know, my core focus is real estate investing. And, you know, back in the day, I had read the four hour work week and, you know, that led me into understanding how virtual assistants work. And so I, you know, November of 2008 was when I hired my first VA. And that was kind of the birth of like, oh, this is pretty cool, right? I can assign this and then I don't have to do it. And then it's done, you know, a couple hours later, the next day or so forth. And it opened my eyes to potential and the opportunity that I really had. And so I just continued with that and I obsessed over it. And I've had VAs working every single day with me since November, 2008. So it's been a really long time. From there, the story to build the business is I had a team member who was with me and she came to me and said, hey, listen, you should build a company out of this. You keep telling people how to go get VAs. Why don't you just provide them? I'm like, yeah, I don't know. I don't wanna, I don't wanna run that business. She's like, well, we will. And so sure enough, we put a team together. I said, all right, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll fund it and you guys execute it. And so we did. And the company grew a bit. Um, and then we exploded and had huge growth. And I kind of figured out what our exact niche was going to be, our model, you know, the exact service offering that was going to hit the most people with the most value. And then the company grew like crazy. And so that's kind of how the VA company. You've got high quality professionals working on your team. It's not just you know, for, for menial tasks or, or, or data right. entry or something like that. So I, I'm interested. The, the first question I had was like, what type of niche did you get into? Yeah. Um, when you said like you, you guys dove into a niche. Because I have a marketing agency, we focus on marketing services. So all things that fall under the umbrella of marketing services from building funnels and landing pages, CRMs and running ads and anything that, that involves the marketing world, websites and, you know, social media content and copywriting and everything. So I decided to stick where, you know, where my expertise was. And so that's where our attention has been, has always been kind of marketing virtual assistants, plus EAs, you know, executive assistants and general admin as well. That's been our niche. It's worked really well because I can 
go sign a client over here and then go, hey, by the way, you could have somebody do this for you, right? Or I can leverage those people to fulfill services over here. And so that's been how we built it. That's awesome. My follow-up question to that too, just because like in the businesses that I'm involved in and, and from what I see on the day-to-day, -day, like it changes yes. every single day, right? And so like with, with AI and things that are coming in the future, do you see virtual assistants becoming more important for, for business operators across the world? And do you see their role changing at all? My guess would be that they're, they're taking the, the new technologies and, and using that to, to better serve and even further scale the business. You know, when it comes to AI, especially stuff like that, you know, the VAs that are smart, they come in realizing that that's the future. And so they're, you know, they're jumping on it and they're jumping on board. And so when they come in and they say, hey, listen, like, yeah, I use ChatGPT every day. It's like, okay, now you and I should talk. We should have this conversation. I say you and I, my HR team. That puts them ahead of everybody else because they understand where the world is going. And I think that it's opening more doors for more people, regardless if they're virtual assistants or if they're local or, you know, whatever it is. If somebody's playing the game that exists, they're going to have opportunity at all times. If they're playing the future and today's game, they're going to have opportunity. It's when people get stuck in the past and the things that were working yesterday and they don't pay attention to the trends and, and how business actually operates, that's when people get in trouble. And I think that you're seeing that a lot as people say, well, AI is going to take over jobs. No, AI is going to transform jobs. And the same thing's going to happen in the virtual assistant world. Those that come to the table understanding how important AI is and how to leverage it and how to make their lives better and make them more efficient, therefore they become more valuable to their client, that's how they're going to win. Right. Yeah. And I've seen it like in so many different businesses where like, you know, being specialized, you can have somebody that operates at a very high level and no matter, you know, how good you are, how, how good I want to be, like, I can't spend six hours a day being an expert at right. opus.io or whatever the heck it is. Right. And so the virtual assistant who maybe used to do video editing is now right. using the AI stuff like opus.io and it's like, yeah, now I can edit a hundred clips a day yeah. instead of, you know, being able to only edit 10. And so I'm 10 times more efficient and more valuable. My question that I have to ask too, because I've utilized virtual assistants, see the huge value in them. The challenge for me in businesses that, that I ran was always training. Yep. And I think a lot of business owners, a lot of listeners will also have the same questions. Like it's hard to train someone who's in the office next to me. Right. How do you guys assist like with, with the training up of the virtual assistants? Well, so they're going to come in with that specialized knowledge. So if like, as an example, if they build websites and they're a developer, right, they, they already come to the table knowing that getting them acclimated to your business happens, whether they're local or whether they're overseas, it doesn't matter. That has to happen. So that is just flat out how it's going to be. Regardless, what we do is I give every one of our clients, I give them an SOP structure, a training structure. It's actually quite simple. I think everybody should do this no matter where anybody is. But the idea is around how people actually consume information. So you have people who are both visual, so they're gonna to wanna to see things. You have people who are auditory, so they're gonna to wanna to hear. You have people who are kinesthetic, they need to do it. But then you also have these kind of unique people that are auditory digital, which means that they're gonna to wanna to consume it, internalize it, think it through, put it into practice, and then give you an analysis and tell you how it is. So what we focus on is when we're training somebody, we have to hit all of those different training, you know, knowledge, you know, bases. How do they consume information? And so what we do in all of our training is we start with video and we make a video of us doing the thing that we're trying to train them to do. You have the video side of it, which is going to be visual. You have the auditory piece of it, which is auditory. Then we use a, a method called play, pause, do where you play the video, we tell them in the video, okay, pause this video and go do what I just showed you. Then come back and hit play once you've succeeded. So then they pause the video, they go do the thing, they come back, they hit play, they go to the next piece. And they do that over and over and over again. And then that whole thing is transcribed for those people who wanna sit down, they wanna read, they wanna internalize it and do all those things. So we really, really focus on how you communicate to people. If you were to evaluate the number one reason that people have challenges with hiring, with training, with virtual assistants in general, it's communication. Most people are awful communicators. We forget that it's our job to make sure that somebody else understands what we're saying. It's our job. It's not their job to
put that into play, hiring, training, building teams, getting what you want, creating good expectations, all of it changes in your business. It gets so easy and it seriously scales up your success. Yeah, I believe that wholeheartedly. A little bit of, uh, you know, extreme ownership. Like, don't expect a miracle, you know, pill that just you plug in and, 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 and off you go. There's going to be some work involved and whatnot in training. Um, I, I saw you recently posted, and I, and I want to pull on this thread because I think it's super, super interesting, the idea of leading indicators versus lagging indicators. Right. Because, you know, as a business owner myself, as somebody who coaches loan officers, it's so important. And there's a lot of businesses where you don't get to see the outcome right away. I saw that piece you did and I thought it was amazing, like the importance of, of leading indicators. Right. So my guess is like with virtual assistants and with, you know, staff that, that's in-house or all of it, like there's a certain level of tracking going on to track those leading indicators. Tell us a little bit about, you know, maybe recap it for those that didn't see it like I did, the, the leading indicators versus lagging indicators. Well, so a lot of people want to look at metrics that are after the fact. And the challenge with that is that by the time you get to those lagging indicators, the things that are possibly a red flag or, hey, this didn't work out well, it's too late a lot of times. These leading indicators are the metrics that you put in front of any project that you might have. And when you start to evaluate those and you start to manage everything that's happening before the output, everything changes because the expectations are improved. Somebody's output is going to be that much better when you're actually keying metrics based on what's supposed to come down the road. Training somebody to actually understand something effectively. Do they know it? Can they support other team members? I know this is like, you know, a, a little bit in left field as well, but one of the things that's changed for us is the ability to, the, or the way that we actually get people up to speed is we, we use a teaching model. So nobody understands anything until they can teach somebody else and that person can then teach somebody else. We created this like scaling model. And so what's really been interesting is when we train somebody, we know, okay, they can conceptually do it, right? We saw them do the task and the thing works. Okay, that's fine. But now do you understand it enough to turn around and make somebody else knowledgeable to be able to do it? And then they train somebody else. And then that person can then teach somebody else. And so what we end up with is just this knowledge base that's just so deep. And so what we find on the back end is all the KPIs and all the performance metrics that our clients want, those get hit so much easier because of all the work we do on the front end. Yeah. And that's been a super, super effective. And it's something we've kind of implemented over the past year that's been pretty cool. Yeah. In the mortgage world too, it's like, you know, it's, it's all numbers. And in yes. any business, you know, you can, you can back track into metrics and say, if you did this many phone calls, had this many applications, had this many talk tos, had this many, you're going to get the results three, six, nine months down the road. But, you know, to your point, I, that's what I really enjoyed about it was like, Focus on the leading indicators. Oh, by the way, are the things you can control. You can't control the outcome. And honestly, like that's something that really excites me when I talk to salespeople, especially ones that are struggling. If you can explain it in a way and articulate it in a way, and I don't know if I'm, I'm great at articulating it, that if you do the leading indicators and you hit those metrics, you will see the outcome you want. You can't just hope for the outcome and then it appears, right? So I, I really, really enjoyed that. And hopefully the Get Better Every Day audience uh, gets, gets something out of that because uh, so many people, like you said too, it's like you put a goal up on the wall. I want to do 100 million in mortgages this year. So I know that's 25 million a quarter and 8.3 million per month. Like that is not going to help you at all if you don't have a plan in place right. and leading indicators and metrics that you're trying to hit to get to that. Yeah, and how many, you know, how many salespeople do you put in place to get to 25 million a, month, uh, a quarter? You know, like how many people right. is that? What was the training of those people before you even, you know, before you even put them in place? Those simple things that you can do on the front end, you can completely control. And so when somebody doesn't hit the goals on the end, on the back end of their, you know, all of their KPIs that they're trying to reach, when they don't hit those, all you can do is you can just circle back and say, what happened before? How good was our training? How much effort did we put into this? How much support did we give our team? Was there enough resources? All of those things on the front end, you can then improve. And then the outcome on the back end is so much easier. So I know you've got um, level nine, like, yep. like the hat says, the, 
the, the virtual assistant business. I know you've you've scaled multiple businesses. What other what other businesses can you tell us about where uh, you know you've you've had an idea like you said and you're you're a visionary. Yeah. You've got the, the people who can deliver on the vision. Uh, Helping you scale it. So I have a marketing agency in the wedding industry. We focus mainly on wedding venues. And we have a marketing and sales system that we I created, I guess, nine years ago. And we've implemented over 300 venues around the world. We have offices in 11, uh, 10 countries, including the United States. And so we do partnerships with these other kind of licensee type deals in these other countries. I personally am not the type of person who should be doing business with, you know, somebody in the UK as an example. I don't look it. I don't, you know, talk the part. So I found that licensing was a great way to do it. And I take a revenue share off of you know, those businesses. The most recent company we started is called visitormatch.com. It is identity resolution. And so if you have anonymous website visitors to your site, you have people who show up to your site, but they bounce. Most people, 80% or more of traffic, come to your website and then leave. They come to a landing page, they hit your funnel, they leave. So they don't actually convert into filling out a form. They don't pick up the phone and call you. We can actually match a significant percentage of those people to actual user profiles with name, email, sometimes phone number if it's there and we scrub it for the do not call list, addresses, net worth, marital status, age, all of these different things. We tell you what pages they were on on your site. And then one of the things that we're starting to do is a lead scoring tool. So as people hit your site and maybe they never took any action, but they come back and then they come back again and we're starting to map what they're doing and we're going to create a process that actually sends you notifications says, Hey, this person's been to your site X number of times. It's probably a good idea to pick up the phone and call this person, or it's a good idea to reach out to this person because they're looking. And so this is a pretty unique opportunity. I think it's only going to get bigger and people are going to have to, again, make data driven decisions. And this is one of the data, you know, data sets they're going to have to deal with. Yeah, man, dude, it feels like technology is moving so fast. You know, my young, young, ripe age of 43 years old, I'm, I'm thinking to myself of the applications of it, right? You know, I've got a landing page and somebody sees me on YouTube and, and goes to it. And I don't know why they didn't fill it out. And quite honestly, I would never know they were there. But, you know, apparently there's there's data out there that, that can tell me possibly who that person is. And I can just reach out and say, hey. It's a weird thing as a consumer because you realize like privacy doesn't exist. So that's kind of weird on one sense. But we also give up our privacy intentionally plenty of times every day, right? And it's the Netflix and the Hulus and your bank and you get a mortgage and they sell that information to the next mortgage company. And, you know, there's a reason when you apply for a credit card, you get a whole bunch of offers right after that. Credit bureaus, they sell your data, right? All of these places are selling your data. All that we are doing is we're aggregating mass amounts of data and then we're putting it into a consumable format that we can actually leverage in the marketing and the sales world. That's it. It's not anything, you know, overly insane. It's just the fact that data exists in mass. And then once we have a way that we can actually use it, it's very, very effective. It's probably going to be the fastest growing business I've ever had. It's, it's pretty remarkable. And it's, you know, most importantly is that it's providing an insane ROI for our clients. So when somebody starts using it, the ROI on it is just nuts. And that's been pretty cool to watch. And so in the virtual world, you're like, Hey, you stopped by, but you didn't fill out the form. Is there any questions you might have? Correct. Any mortgage? Yeah. And, and so it's done correctly. It's not, it's not like, you know, it's not invasive. Yeah. 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 And the way that we typically see it running and the most effective is when you have somebody who runs ads to their business. So whether it's Google ads or Facebook or YouTube or whatever it is. So they're running ads. They send it to a page, a landing page, a website, whatever it is. 80 plus percent of those people leave. And so what we do is we pixel those people, we match their profiles, but we take those profiles and we run them back into the ad platform and run ads back to those people again. So then very often those people click and come back and then they take us up on whatever it is, the offer, the lead magnet, the information, they fill out the form, they take that action. If not, we also run them through an email series and we send them content. We never pick up the phone and call cold out of nowhere. We don't send text messages because that's a dangerous way to play the game, but what we do is we get into email marketing. So guess what? Email marketing's back and it's awesome. And we run email marketing, like legit marketing. And we send a series of campaigns. Now, when they open it and they click, that becomes a contextual point that we believe they're warm enough to then make direct contact and actually reach out. 
And so we're looking at all of the contextual like touch points. They saw your ad, they see your landing page, they leave and see, see another ad, possibly they come back and get another landing page, they got the email, they open it, they click it. There's so many contextual points so that by the time that you actually make contact, it doesn't feel like, how'd you get my info? It's like, right. well, I get it, I've been everywhere, I've seen them over and over again. So we don't look at it from like, hey, somebody hit your site, now just contact them. No, we're like doing this methodically. We're doing a, a really, really good job with marketing and communication and sharing value and all those things. And then it's killing it. Yeah. And for a business owner, I would imagine that if you have, you know, say two different landing pages and you have the data now, why are they filling out the form 17% of the time on this one and 32% of the time yeah. on this one? Maybe this has a more enticing offer. Maybe this one's clearer to the sure. you know, average person that we're directing the site. So man, dude, just data and math nerdiness. <laughs> I don't know anything about the technology, so I'll leave that to you and, and your team. But yeah. I love it, man. I uh, I know we're on a time constraint. Sure. So any any last um, advice to get better everyday listeners? I think there's going to be entrepreneurs. There's going to be sure. all kinds of folks doing all kinds of different things, and you know, hopefully trying to get better every day. You know, this has been a topic I've been on a lot lately, which is you know, fail and fail fast and get okay with the idea that you're not going to be doing well at everything at all times. Go try something new. Go test that idea. Go make mistakes. The challenge is that when you make the mistakes, do you learn the lesson and then move forward and take fast action. And so I like to say fail fast. And the idea being fail fast is that I can go make more mistakes in an idea before anybody ever starts. And because of that is the reason that we've been able to grow now six companies online all of them other than one is a set, you know, seven to eight figures a year. And it's all because we go make mistakes all the time. My team has complete authority to make mistakes, learn from their mistakes, you know, and we have, again, we have our metrics, we have our, our leading indicators and we know how much is being allocated as resources that they can go and they can screw up. And as long as they're not losing clients and they're not harming people and they're not doing things wrong, but they're taking ideas and they're putting them in practice and finding out if we get something good out of it, I'm going to challenge everybody to do that every day. And so that would be my, I guess, my advice to everybody. It's the advice I give to my kids. I'm like, go out and fail. Go try something, you know? I and so that. that's it. it.